Room at the Top by John Brain I came to Worley on a wet September morning. I remember saying to myself, No more zombies, Joe. No more zombies. My clothes were my Sunday best, a light grey suit that had cost 14 guineas, a plain grey tie, plain grey socks and brown shoes. The shoes were the most expensive I've ever possessed, with a deep, rich, nearly black luster. My trench coat and my hat, though, weren't up to the same standard. The coat, after only three months, was badly wrinkled and smelled of rubber, and the hat was faintly discoloured with hair oil and pinched to a sharp point in front. Later I learned, among other things, never to buy cheap raincoats, to punch the dents out of my hat before I put it away, and not to have my clothes match too exactly in shade and colour. But I looked well enough that morning ten years ago. I hadn't then begun to acquire a middle-aged spread, and, whether it sounds sentimental or not, I had a sort of eagerness and lack of disillusion, which more than made up for the coat and hat and the ensemble like a uniform. The other evening I found a photo of myself taken shortly after I came to live in Worley. My hair is plastered into a skull cap, my colour doesn't fit, and the knot of my tie, held in place by a hideous pin shaped like a dagger, is far too small. That doesn't matter, for my face is not innocent exactly, but unused. I mean, unused by sex, by money, by making friends and influencing people, hardly touched by any of the muck one's forced to wade through to get what one wants. This was the face that Mrs. Thompson saw. I'd arranged my lodgings to an advertisement in the Worley Courier. She was waiting by the ticket barrier. I gave up my ticket and turned to her. Mrs. Thompson? She smiled. She had a pale, composed face and dark hair turning grey. You're Joe Lampton, she said. I hope you had a pleasant journey. Is it far to Eagle Road, I asked. We could get a taxi. There were half a dozen of them in the station yard, their drivers all apparently frozen at the steering wheels. That's a good idea, she said. When we were in the taxi, she gave me a long look. It was searching, but not embarrassing. As cool and dry, but as friendly and firm as a handshake. I had the impression of having passed some test. I'll call you Mr. Lampton, if you like, she said, but I'd rather call you Joe. She spoke without a trace of awkwardness or flirtatiousness. She had now, her attitude implied, settled the whole matter. And my name is Joan, she added. <laughs> That'll be fine, I said. This is St. Clair Road, she said, as the taxi turned up a long, steep hill. We live at the top. It's always tip-top in Worley, though, with a capital T. She spoke very well, I noticed. She had a low but clear voice, with no hint either of the over books and bowels of Yorkshire or the plum in the mouth of the home counties. I congratulated myself on my good fortune. All too easily, she might have been the usual sort of landlady, smelling of washing soda and baking powder. My lodgings might easily have been one of those scruffy little houses by the station from one dufton to another. Instead, I was going to the top, into a world that, even from my first brief glimpses, filled me with excitement. Big houses with drives and orchards and manicured hedges, a preparatory school to which the boys would soon return from adventures in Brittany and Brazil and India, or at the very least, an old castle in Cornwall, expensive cars, Bentleys, Lagondas, Daimlers, Jaguars, parked everywhere in a kind of ostentatious litter, as if the district had dropped them at random as evidence of its wealth. And above all, the wind coming from the moors and the woods on the far horizon. <laughs> the hall of the house smelled of beeswax and fruit, and there was a large copper vase of mimosa on a small oak table. Against the cream-painted walls I could see the faint reflection of the mimosa and the vase, chrome yellow and near gold. It looked almost too good to be true, like an illustration from Homes and Gardens. My room at Eagle Road was the first room of my own in the real sense of the word. I don't count my cubicle in the NCO's quarters at Frinton Bassett because 
I hardly ever used it except for sleeping. And I always had the feeling that it had been made impersonal by the very number of others there before me, living on the verge of departure to another station or death. Nor do I count my room at my Auntie Emily's. It was strictly a bedroom. You read and wrote and talked and listened to the wireless in the living room. It was as if the names of the rooms were taken quite literally. Now, following Mrs. Thompson into my room, I was moving into a different world. It's marvellous, I said, feeling the inadequacy of the words and yet not wanting to appear too impressed. After all, I hadn't been living in the slums. I looked at it with incredulous delight. Wallpaper vertically striped in beige and silver. A bay window extending for almost the whole length of the room with fitted cushions along it. A divan bed that looked like a divan and not like a bed with its depressing daylight imitations of sleep and sickness. Two armchairs and a dressing table, wardrobe and writing table, all in the same pale satiny wood. On the cream-painted bookcase was a bowl of anemones, and there was a fire burning in the grate, leaving an aromatic smell, faintly acid and faintly flower-like, which I knew but couldn't quite place. Applewood, Mrs. Thompson said. Thanks to the coal shortage, we're becoming connoisseurs. There's an electric fire, but I thought a real one would be more cheerful on a miserable day like this. She took a bunch of keys from the dressing table. Your keys, Joe, before I forget. Front door, this room, wardrobe and bureau. We've never had a lodger before. Her voice paused perceptibly at the word lodger, as if considering and rejecting all the euphemisms paying guest, young gentlemen to stay with us, and so on. But I've suffered from landladies myself in my younger days. I do want you to understand, Joe, that your room's entirely your own, and you must bring your friends any time you like. She hesitated. If ever you feel lonely, it's always a little strange at first, living in a new place. You'll be very welcome downstairs. Is this the first time you've been away from home? Apart from the forces, I mean. Why, well, it is and it isn't. My father and mother were killed during the war and I've been living at my Aunt Emily's. What sort of place is Dufton, exactly? Well, a lot of mills. And a chemical factory. And a grammar school. And a war memorial. And a river that runs different colours each day. And a cinema and fourteen pubs. And that's really all I can say about it. To my friend Charles and me, it was always dead Dufton and the councillors and chief officials and anyone we didn't approve of were called zombies. The fat zombie's been watering the beer again, I'd remark as the landlord of the Dufton Horseman wattled by in a new worsted suit. <laughs> he didn't come by that new shroud, honestly. And there were many others. We knew a great deal about the people of Dufton. Much more, for instance, than the adulterous zombie and the child-loving zombie, two of the town's most prominent citizens, realised. If they had, we shouldn't have kept our jobs very long. We have, a, we have a very good little theatre in Worley, Mrs. Thompson said. The Worley Thespians. <laughs> Silly name, really. You must come to our next social evening, Joe. They'll snap you up. Men are scarce. I raised my eyebrows. Oh, <laughs> male actors, I should have said. She smiled. Though handsome young bachelors are greatly in demand, too. Once I'd unpacked, I went out into Eagle Road. The houses were a mixed bag, in every style from mullion and half timber to what, from its white walls and dark green roof and profusion of ironworks, I took to be Spanish. Against the background of Dufton, the back-to-back -back houses, the outside privy, the smoke which caught the throat and dirty clean linen in a couple of hours, I relished the sensation of release and lightness, of having more than one's fair share of oxygen, which I experienced that September afternoon. The town hall was a queer mixture of Gothic and Palladian, with battlements and turrets and pillars and two stone lions. It was rather like Dufton's, like a hundred others for that matter. As soon as I passed the front door, I recognised the municipal smell of radiators, disinfectant and floor polish. The food office was like Dufton's too, 
The long counter, the trestle tables, the rows of filing boxes, the bright posters appealing for blood, for safety on the roads, for volunteers for the army. It was empty, except for two girls behind the counter. The elder, a plump girl with black eyes, attended to me. You're coming to work at the Treasurer's, aren't you? She asked. I saw your picture in the courier. Doesn't do you justice, though. Was it Beryl? He's smashing, said Beryl, and she stared at me impudently. I'm even more smashing when you get to know me better, I said. I've hidden charms, they giggled. I crossed into the market square for a cup of tea. Inside Sylvia's cafe, I took a seat by the window and ordered a pot of tea. It was a long curved window extending along the front of the cafe like a ship's bridge. My table was placed at the centre of the window, and I was able to see all the streets which led into the square. Market Street was the broadest, forming one side of the square. Three other streets, narrow and cobbled, ran off it, one at each of the top corners, another, scarcely wide enough to take two walking abreast, halfway up the left-hand side. Then, at the moment the waiters brought the tea, something happened which changed my whole life. Well, perhaps that isn't exactly true. I suppose that my instincts would have led me to where I am now, even if I hadn't been sitting at the window of Sylvia's cafe that afternoon. Perhaps I wasn't directed in the Ministry of Labour sense, but I was certainly shown the way to a destination quite different from the one I had in mind for myself at that time. Parked by a solicitor's office opposite the cafe was a green Aston Martin Tourer, low-slung with cycle-type mudguards. It had the tough functional smartness of the good British sports car. It's a quality which is difficult to convey without using the terms of the advertising copywriter, made by craftsmen, thoroughbred, and so on. I can only say that it was a beautiful piece of engineering, and leave it at that. Pre-war, it would have cost as much as three baby saloons. It wasn't the sort of vehicle for business or for family outings, but quite simply, a rich man's toy. As I was admiring it, a young man and a girl came out of the solicitor's office. The young man was turning the ignition key when the girl said something to him, and after a moment's argument, he put up the windscreen. The girl smoothed his hair for him. I found the gesture disturbing in an odd way. It was again as if a barrier had been removed, but this time by an act of reason. The ownership of the Aston Martin automatically placed the young man in a social class far above mine. But that ownership was simply a question of money. The girl, with her even suntan and her fair hair cut short in a style too simple to be anything else but expensive, was as far beyond my reach as the car. But her ownership, too, was simply a question of money, of the price of the diamond ring on her left hand. This seems all too obvious, but it was the kind of truth which, until that moment, I'd only grasped theoretically. As I watched the tail end of the Aston Martin with its shiny new GB plate go out of sight, I remembered the second-hand Austin 7 which the efficient zombie, Dufter's chief treasurer, had just treated himself to. This was the most the local government had to offer me. It wasn't enough. I made my choice then and there. I was going to enjoy all the luxuries which that young man enjoyed. I was going to collect that legacy. It was as clear and compelling as a sense of vocation which doctors and missionaries are supposed to experience, though in my instance, of course, the call ordered me to do good to myself, not others. How to attain this, I didn't know. I was like an officer, fresh from training school, unable for the moment to translate the untidiness of fear and cordite and corpses into the obvious and irresistible method of attack. I was going to take the position, though. I was sure of that. I was moving into the attack, and no one had better try to stop me. General Joe Lampton, you might say, had opened hostilities. Bob and Diva Store came to tea the next day. I was to be very friendly with them later, that afternoon I found them rather intimidating. At first I thought that they were brother and sister. They were so much alike, small, dark, with snub noses and big mouths. They talked a lot, mostly about the theatre, with special reference to the Warley Thespians. 
They both talked as if they were in constant contact with the professional theatre. In actuality, they knew only a handful of professionals, mostly young people not long out of theatre school. And the thespians occasionally had actors and playwrights visit them as lecturers, mostly down at heel on entities, but each with his or her stock of scandal, in return for free drinks and, with luck, a substantial supper and bed for the night. I wasn't aware of these facts till much later, of course. I thought Bob and Eva immensely sophisticated. They gave me the sensation of being in the know, of being close to a wicked, exciting, above all, wealthy world. Bob, it transpired, was in textiles, but precisely what he did in textiles, I couldn't discover. I noticed that when he remembered to, he clipped his words. He's learned that from Ronald Coleman, I thought, and felt a little less impressed. It put him on the same level as the mill hand with the Alan Ladd deadpan and the mill girl with the Veronica Lake hairstyle. Do you act? he asked me. I have done, I said. There's never been much time for it, though. You've a nice profile, Eva said, and a deep brown voice. It's time we had a new man. I joined the thespians with the vision of being constantly embraced by handsome young men. And the only man who ever makes love to me is my own husband. I could do that at home. That's right, said Bob and gave her a facetious leer. Suddenly, I had a mental picture of them in bed together. Eva gave me a cool, appraising look. I wondered if she knew what I was thinking. We'll introduce him to Ronnie, and arrange an audition, Mrs. Thompson said briskly. Don't introduce him to Alice, Eva said. She's hunting for fresh meat. Shh, said Mrs. Thompson. You're giving Joe the wrong impression. Are you spoken for, Joe? Eva asked. <laughs> no one will have me, I said. I'll see that you meet some really nice girls, she said. After tea, we went to the thespians in Bob's car. It was a new Austin 8. It was very difficult to get new cars, particularly small ones at that time, and it occurred to me that whatever he did in textiles must be outstandingly profitable. The theatre had a façade of glaring white concrete and a big illuminated sign over the entrance. Its lowercase lettering made the theatre look like a nightclub, which I assume was the impression that had been aimed at. There was nothing out of the ordinary about the audience. I'd half expected the theatre to be full of people like Bob and Eva, being determinedly witty and theatrical at the top of their voices. There was nothing out of the ordinary about the play, either. It had run for three years during the war, I'd missed it, being in Stalag Thousand at the time it was produced. It dealt with a very charming upper-middle-class family, the members of which nearly committed adultery, nearly made a fortune, nearly made an unwise marriage, nearly missed their true vocation, and so on, everything being made right in the end by the wise old grandmother, who, rather daringly for this kind of play, spoke the prologue and epilogue, swaying to and fro on her rocking chair and fiddling about with a piece of knitting to break up her speeches. It was halfway through Act One that I saw Susan for the first time. She had a fresh young voice and the accent of a good finishing school. She was supposed to be sixteen in that play, but she had none of the puppy fat and slight clumsiness of that age, and I judged her to be about nineteen. She couldn't act very well, but for me she brought the whole silly play to life. What appealed to me most about her was that she was conventionally pretty, black shoulder-length hair, large round hazel eyes, neat nose, and mouth, and dimples. Charles and I once worked out a grading scheme for women, having noticed that the more money a man had, the better looking was his wife. We even typed out a schedule, the Lampton Lufford Report on Love. There was an appendix with sex summaries. I remember that a grade one woman gave one such a marvellous time in bed that it was just as well that all grade one husbands had inherited fortunes because they couldn't possibly have had any strength to spare for earning money. And grade four men were awarded a little extra with each promotion. Oh, darling, I'm so glad the directors are appreciating you at last, she said with her eyes misty. And grade nine, of course, only indulged on Saturday night and Sunday afternoon. The grade corresponded naturally with the income of husband or fiancé running from one, for millionaires and film stars and dictators, anyone with an income over £20,000, in fact, to 12 for those under £350, 
and not likely to get any more. Charles and I belonged to grade seven, which was for the six hundred pound and over deputy and assistant head group. We really belonged to the grade below, but the point of the whole scheme was that husbands were chosen as much on eventual as actual salary. A certain level of intelligence being taken for granted in women above grade ten standard. Our schedule didn't work out perfectly, of course. Sometimes men in grade seven would have grade three wives, women capable of acquiring five thousand a year men, and self-made grade three men would have grade ten wives whom they'd been hooked by before they'd made their pile. But the grade seven men generally lost their wives to lovers who really understood and appreciated them, or worse still, had to endure them grumbling about money for the rest of their lives. And the grade three men generally got grade three mistresses. This, no doubt, all seems very cynical. But the fact is that Charles and I could eventually work out husbands' incomes to the nearest fifty pounds. Susan was grade two, if not grade one, whether or not she had any money. But I had a shrewd idea that she'd qualify for the grade financially as well as sexually. To be quite fair to myself, this wasn't the only reason that I was excited by her. That the genteel commonplaces of the play seemed profoundly poetic. That it seemed that at any moment. There had been enunciation which would transform existence into what it ought to be, hold as it were to its bargain the happiness which Worley had promised me, and I should have felt exactly the same if I had been an honest, simple type to whom the whole idea of grading women was beastly cynicism. She was so young and innocent that it nearly broke my heart. In a queer but pleasurable way, it actually hurt me to look at her. If flesh had a taste. Hers, I imagine, would be like new milk. I fell in love with her at first sight. When we were putting on our coats in the foyer afterwards, Cedric Thompson said, "I assume you need some alcoholic refreshment after that, Joe." I heard the words, but did not connect them into a message. Susan Brown's very beautiful," I said. Then I realised what a moonstruck calf I must appear to be. And to my disgust, found myself reddening. Eva laughed. I'm livid with jealousy. She gave me a blow on my chest with more force than playfulness behind it. As soon as I meet a handsome young man, he falls for that flippity gibbet. She always seemed a bit insipid to me, Bob said. Strictly the bread and butter, Miss. Oh no, said Eva quickly. It's very nice for you, darling, to say she is not attractive, but it just isn't true. Joe has good taste. She's beautiful, yes, really beautiful, fresh as a rose on the day of battle, or whatever that poem is, and a truly sweet-natured child. Well, who wouldn't be with a rich and adoring papa? Bob said. I think Joe had better meet her," said Mrs. Thompson. You really are smitten, aren't you, Joe? Eva said as we walked down the passage behind the foyer.、Uh, I suppose she's already attached to someone. I said gloomily. She's not engaged, Bob said. But watch out for Jack Wales. Bags of money, about seven foot tall, and a beautiful RAF moustache. <laughs> I laughed. I eat those tights for breakfast. I said. Besides, my admiration is purely artistic. Oh, even to me, it didn't sound very convincing. But I felt myself being pushed into the position of the poor man at the gate, the humble admirer from afar. The dressing room was already crowded when we reached it. It was a narrow room with a concrete floor and a long table with lighted mirrors above it. It smelled agreeably of makeup and tobacco and well-fed, well-washed bodies. Susan had just taken off her makeup, and was wiping the remaining cream from her face. I noticed with a shock of pleasure. How white and delicate her skin was. This is Joe Lampton, Eva said. He's come all the way from Dufton. He liked the show very much. Particularly you, I said. Her hand was childishly warm and soft, and I would have liked to have held it far longer, but ineffectual habits like that were zombie habits. Trying to make a dinner out of an hors d'oeuvre. So I didn't extend the handshake for more than a second. I'm not awfully good, really," she said. I was close to her, but I had to strain to catch the words. Susan always lowered her voice when she felt shy. 
if I'd known, I'd have brought you some flowers, I said. Her dark lashes came down over her eyes, and she looked away from me for a moment. It was the kind of gesture which only a virgin could have got away with. Because it was so natural and unstudied, it moved me almost to tears. If you'd known what? If I'd known you'd be so beautiful. Her blouse had a button too many unfastened. She saw me looking at her, but made no effort to fasten the button. The revelation of some kind of promise, though it hadn't, I was sure, been deliberate. Coming over for a drink, honey? Eva asked her. I'd love to, but Jack and I are promised at home for supper. Bring Jack too, Bob said. Then Jack came in. I knew it was him straight away. The big RAF moustache was worn with the right degree of nonchalance. He'd been an officer. It was an officer's adornment. I never grew one myself for precisely that reason. If you wear one and haven't been commissioned, people look upon you as if you were wearing a uniform or decorations you weren't entitled to. What annoyed me the most about him was that he stood four inches above me and was broader across the shoulders. He had an amiable, rugged face, the bulldog Drummond type, and no doubt, I thought viciously, well aware of it. Hello there, Sue, he said. He looked at his watch. One, nine, three, oh, precisely. Operation supper to begin, he laughed, well pleased with his own facetiousness. He looked at me sharply. This is Joe Lampton, Bob said. Jack Wales, Joe Lampton. You should have something in common. You were both intrepid birdmen, weren't you? Jack laughed and put out a ham-like hand. He tried to outgrip me, but he couldn't manage it. Speaking for myself, he said, I'm glad it's over. Flying's fun, but being shot at is most disconcerting. Too true, I said. Not that the fun of flying didn't pall upon me eventually. What blasé young men you are, Eva said. Can we ask you to have a drink, Jack? Terribly sorry, he said. But you know what a stickler for punctuality a Papa Brown is. Some other time we'd be delighted. Or rather, I'd be delighted, he winked heavily at Eva. We'll leave the others behind. Just you and me, eh? We were all listening to him as if he were royalty, explaining graciously that it was impossible, owing to other engagements, to open the bazaar. But perhaps some other time. When he and Susan left, there'd be an emptiness in the room. They'd be travelling into warmth and luxury and gaiety, and we, somehow, would be left to a cold Monday drabness. I didn't add my pleadings to Eva's, though I had an intuition that Susan would have liked to have gone with us. That doesn't have to coax me to sup some ale, lass, I said to Eva, deliberately dropping into a broad Yorkshire to counter-attack Wales's genuine officer accent, as carelessly correct as his tweed suit. Come on, I turned to Susan, giving her my best smile. I'll remember flowers next time, I said. Thank you, she said, and I saw her blush. When we were outside in the street, Eva gave me another mock playful blow in the chest. You're a very direct sort of person, aren't you? I always go straight for what I want. Bob grinned maliciously. Jack didn't like your promise of flowers. I detected signs of jealousy. He's not engaged to her. Ah, but he's known her all his life. Childhood sweethearts and all that. How pretty, I said. After a couple of months, I found myself for the first time completely happy in my work. And I joined the thespians and was beginning to mix with people of a kind I'd never mixed with before. The thespians were like a club, one which particularly, if you were a young man, was very easy to join. It was exclusive too, Though there was nothing to stop working-class people joining it, they somehow never did. Apart from that, the thespians gave me something which I'd never enjoyed before, the sense of belonging, of being part of a community. Perhaps that sounds portentous, but let it stand. All in all, I was happy and contented. Too much so, perhaps. I'd already forgotten the resolution I made that afternoon at Sylvia's Café. It was the first reading of Meadows Farm, when I arrived at the Thespians, the producer, Ronnie Smith, was already there. He worked in a bank, though you wouldn't have believed it at first sight. He was wearing green suede shoes, a very old pair of flannels, 
a yellow crewneck sweater and a golf jacket. With his seamed face and brilliantine hair thinning at the temples, he looked like a middle-aged actor, which I suppose was exactly what he wanted. Hello there, Joshua, he said, or rather shouted, that being part of the theatrical pose. God, you've got a lovely part out of this world. He repeated the phrase with relish. Yes, out of this world. You'll have to work, though. God, you'll have to work. You're scaring him, said Eva, who just entered with Alice. The lad's come to enjoy himself, aren't you, love? <laughs> Hello, Eva, I said. Hello, Alice. You look most seductive, I must say. That's very kind of you, she said. Actually, I feel terrible. Her voice wasn't very friendly. She certainly wasn't succumbing instantly to my charm in the few weeks since I'd first met her. At the side of Eva, who had a rosy complexion and a bouncing vitality, she did in fact look pale and haggard. She had honey-coloured hair, which at the time she wore in a bun, and thin features. She had an angular-fashioned plate figure, to which her big breasts didn't seem to belong. In the white sweater she was wearing, they seemed to sag with her own weight. In a way, this appealed to me more than firmness. It was a guarantee of reality. I could imagine myself touching them. I repressed the thought. It wasn't any use. Alice wasn't for me. I might as well abandon that idea before it took too firm a hold. I looked at the rest of the cast. Herbert Downs owned a small weaving mill. Johnny Rogers' father owned a coal business. Anne Barbie's father owned three groceries. Jimmy Matthews, the youngest, was attending classes at the Lettersford Technical College. Jimmy was going to help his daddy in the family firm, as no doubt Johnny was. Anne's big brother was learning the grocery business, of course, right from the bottom, just like anyone else. Anne was going to the Letters Ford School of Art, which would keep her out of mischief till she got married, possibly to Johnny, whose father's business was expanding rapidly under the wicked Labour government. They all had more money than me. But it wasn't big money. It was all too easy to reach their grade. So consequently, I didn't respect them very much. I looked at them gesturing freely but jaggedly as they talked in their best accents about the ladies not for burning and jeered at them mentally, one of the landed gentry watching the tradespeople ape their betters. But my feelings of superiority were short-lived. The first reading went very badly. I made a thorough hash of my lines, mispronouncing the simplest words and emphasising almost every sentence incorrectly. We had to stop for a moment when I referred to a roadman's brazier. I joined in the laughter, but it was a considerable effort. Alice said, What a thought! Erotic vices among the working classes. She spoke directly to me. I am working class, I said sulkily. She flushed. You shouldn't... She began, then stopped. I'll tell you afterwards. She smiled at me and then turned back to the script. I kept glancing at her throughout the rest of the play. Sometimes, when she wasn't reading her part, she looked plain, in fact downright ugly. Her chin had a heavy shapelessness, and the lines on her forehead and neck were as if scored with a knife. When she was acting, her face came to life. It wasn't so much that you forgot its blemishes, as that they became endearing and exciting. She made the other women look dowdy and careless. When we finished, Ronnie sat staring at us for a moment, puffing his pipe noisily and fiddling with a sheaf of notes. All right, people, Ronnie said. That's it for tonight. Herbert and I will now try to make sense of the author's lighting plot. Would you like some coffee? I asked Alice as she rose. No, thank you. To hell with you, I thought, and turned on my heel. You can buy me a beer, though. The Clarence. Too many thespians there. Too clean and well lighted. They'll be installing neon soon. The St. Clair's much nicer. We sat in the snug of the St. Clair. Alice looked round her with satisfaction. And this is what I call a snug, she said. So damn cosy, it's almost sinister. The landlord, a thin, grey-haired man, shuffled in. Good evening, Mrs. Aysgill. Good evening, sir. What can I get you? Try the old, Alice said. It's real beer, isn't it, Bert? A lovely drink, Mrs. Aysgill, he said, in his deep, lugubrious voice. A beautiful beer. It was, in fact, very good beer. Dark and sweet and smooth. It was warm and restful in the snug, 
and I liked being with Alice. I didn't feel any necessity to make love to her, and consequently had no fear of rejection. I gave her a cigarette. When I'm on edge, I somehow forget to smoke. It was my first cigarette that evening, and the tobacco tasted pleasantly strong. A hair's breath from being acrid, which is how I like it best. Look, Joe, Alice said. We're going to be working together, so we ought to get everything straight between us. For God's sake, take that chip off your shoulder. Have you got an inferiority complex or what? No, I muttered. What is it? I thought you were coming the lady of the mansion over me, that's all. My father didn't own an engineering works or a mill. But that doesn't mean that... But Joe, dear, she interrupted, who cares about these things? I don't. The Thompsons don't. Eva doesn't. She frowned. It's Susan, isn't it? I didn't answer. I could hit you, she said. She's not engaged, is she? You're not married yourself, are you? Or are you frightened of Jack Wales? Why don't you phone the girl and ask her to go out with you? Well, I never thought of that, I said weakly. The old was stronger than I thought. Halfway through my third pint, a warm rush of affection came over me. I'll tell you something, Alice. I like you. I don't mean sex. I mean, like you. I can talk with you like a man. I can tell you things. Oh, Lord, what, what a lot of... Uh, <laughs> I took another swig of beer. I like you too, she said. You look about eighteen at times, you know that. We stayed till closing time and then she drove me home. It wasn't until I was in bed that I realised that I'd never told any woman as much about myself. Not only that, but I hadn't any fears of having said too much, of having made a fool of myself. The pillow smelled faintly of lavender. It reminded me of something. It was her scent, cool as clean linen, friendly as beer. I went off to sleep without knowing it, into a dream in which I was riding in the Fiat with her, the car skidding wildly round fantastic bends in a country a mixture of Lincolnshire and Prussia. Then she was Susan, her eyes shining, her face distorted with pleasure, and suddenly I was lost in the wild open country, sand and pines and heather, calling out not Susan's name but Alice's, and then in Worley, with the alarm clock ringing, and the sound of bacon frying in the kitchen. The library shared the same building as the town hall. I called there at ten the following morning and found out that Jack would be returning to the university in a couple of days. I stood in a little alcove they called the reference department, feeling absurdly exultant and at the same time envious. Cambridge. I had a mental picture of port wine, boating, Leisurely discussions over long tables gleaming with silver and cut glass. And over it all, the atmosphere of power. Power speaking impeccable standard English. Power which was power because it was born of the right family. Always knew the right people. If you were going to run the country, you couldn't do without a university education. All right, I muttered to myself childishly. I'll pinch your woman, Wales, and all your money won't stop me. I went out to the phone kiosk opposite the town hall and called Susan. Waiting for the operator to put me through, I was half inclined to abandon the whole attempt. If she hadn't answered the phone, it was doubtful whether I would have tried again. Susan Brown speaking, she said. Joe Lampton speaking. How official we sound. There was a pain missing in the kiosk and a cold wind blew in. My hands were shaking with excitement. I've got two tickets for the ballet on Saturday night. I wonder if you care to see it. Saturday night? I, I mean evening, I said, cursing myself. I'd love to see it. Just a minute, Joe. I'm all tangled up. I've just had a bath. I imagined her nakedness, young and firm and fragrant. Then I put the idea out of my head. It was something I didn't want to think about. It wasn't that I didn't desire her physically, but to strip her mentally was adolescent and pimply. It didn't express my true feelings. This I can honestly say. My intentions towards Susan were always those described as honourable. Any other response to her beauty would have seemed shabby. Even apart from her money, she was worth marrying. 
She was the princess in the fairy story. And that moment, I couldn't tell how the story would end. When she left the phone, she seemed to be away for a long time. I thought for a moment that she'd hung up on me, but somewhere in the background I could hear women's voices. I'm sorry to keep you waiting, she said. I couldn't find my engagement book. Saturday evening will be all right, Joe. The first dragon was killed, even if it was only a small one. I tried not to sound too exultant. Grand, I'll call for you at quarter past six, shall I? No, no, she said quickly. I'll meet you at the theatre. A uh, quarter to seven, then. Golly, here's Mummy. I must rush. Goodbye. Goodbye, I said, feeling a little puzzled. Some of the guilt had already been taken off the gingerbread. Why should she panic when her mother came into the room? It was as if she hadn't wanted it to be known that she was going out with me. Wasn't she supposed to go out with anyone except Jack? And was I, unlike him, not good enough to call at her house? Waiting for Susan on Saturday evening, I was excited as if it had been the first time I'd taken a girl out. I was standing in the foyer of the Lettersford Grand. At that moment it seemed to possess a sort of innocent splendour. But at three minutes to seven there was no sign of her, and her whole evening began to turn sour on me. I heard again the panic in her voice. Golly, here's Mummy. Why should she be so frightened of her mother knowing about me? Why shouldn't I call at the house? And why should I? I saw myself as Mummy would see me, uncouth and vulgar and working class. I felt a tap on my shoulder. I've been watching you, she said. You look awfully bad-tempered. Are you very angry with me? Not now you've come. I'm very sorry for being late. Herbert gave me a lift, and something went wrong with the maglet. I laughed. Well, that's very serious. Are you sure it was the maglet? I, I, I don't know about cars, she said. Should I? Now, there's no law that enforces you to. Maglet's very good, anyway. All cars should have a maglet. I took her arm. We'll have to hurry. Two minutes to zero. We settled down to watch the haunted ballroom. I passed her a block of milk chocolate. My hand brushed hers and hovered over it for a second, but it had no responsiveness. If a girl wants her hand to be held, it tightens over yours the moment it's touched. Somehow it seemed tremendously important that I should hold her hand. Contact with her, I felt, would be as different from contact with ordinary women as singing is to speaking. It seemed tremendously important, and yet I didn't want to touch her at all. Brought out, perhaps, by the music and the dancers blown across the stage by it like pieces of coloured paper, a deeply buried instinct asserted itself. I wanted simply to admire what is, after all, a rare human type, a beautiful, unspoiled virgin. I took her to the bar at the interval. Are you enjoying the show? I asked. It's gorgeous. I adore ballet. And the music, it makes me feel all squashy inside. I feel, oh, ever so excited and squiffy. She put her elbow on the table and cupped her chin in her hand. It's ever so difficult to explain. It's like being inside a house, all painted with beautiful colours. And when you listen, it's like touching the paint. The colours all run over your mind. <laughs> Does that sound silly? No. Not one little bit. I've always felt like that myself. Only I can't put it as well as you. <laughs> I was lying, of course. As far as I'm concerned, Bally is something with which to occupy the hours whilst listening to music. But I wouldn't have dreamed of saying so. It was essential that I should appear to share Susan's interests, or rather, that they should appear to coincide. I discover something unimportant to disagree with her about, so that she think me an intelligent type with a mind of my own. I'd like to take you to Sadler's Wells, I said. Have you seen Fontaine? All of them. I talked about ballet till the bell rang, managing rather skilfully, I thought, to conceal the fact that I'd only been to Sadler's Wells once and that Fontaine was the only prima ballerina I'd ever seen. After the show had ended to the usual tumultuous and idiotic applause, 
I asked her if she'd like some coffee. I was helping her on with a coat. I remember noticing with approval that she took the courtesy for granted. Coffee? Oh, that's sweet of you. I'd love some. She made all the other girls I've been out with seem dingy and clumsy and old before their time. The thought came to me tinged with apprehension. I wasn't playing for matches any more. The cafe was just outside the theatre. It was the sort of place I didn't normally go to then. Oak panelling, deep carpets, a four-piece band, and an atmosphere of exclusiveness. I don't mean that I personally was overawed by all the splendid people there. They were mostly fat old woolmen anyway. But I always had the fear of doing the wrong things, of making a fool of myself in front of the higher grades, Saying the wrong thing to the waiter or picking up the wrong fork or not being able to find the cloakroom immediately wouldn't have mattered in an ordinary cafe. In fact, there wouldn't have been any possibility of me making any faux pas. In front of those with no more money than me, there would be no necessity to be careful. People in one's own income group can't be enemies. The rich were my enemies, I felt. They were watching me for the first false move. It's queer when I remember it. I've even bought meals at cafeterias when for a couple of shillings extra I could have had an eatable meal at a good restaurant. That evening with Susan, though, I walked into the cafe quite happily. She was my passport. It was her sort of place. Isn't it nice here? she said. All Dickensy. And look at that little waiter there with a the funny quiff. He's utterly squoo. Don't you think so, Joe? The waiter came over to us with the flat-footed glide of the professional servant. We'd hardly taken our seats before he came over. I wondered for a moment if he'd have come so quickly if I'd not been with Susan. When he got off with the order, Susan looked at me and giggled. Do you think he heard me? I don't care. He was woo. Awfully sad and yet perky like a little monkey. I wonder if he likes his job. I wonder what he thinks of his customers. He'll think you're the most beautiful girl he's ever seen, I said. I was depressed for some time afterwards. It wasn't a tangible sort of depression. It was rather like that washing day sadness which came to one on waking to the realisation that the £75,000 cheque, so convincing even to the two-penny stamp, was, after all, only a dream. I began to shake it off a little when I went to the thespians the following Monday. There's an atmosphere about a theatre at rehearsals that's as comforting as clothes for toothache. When Alice came to sit beside me, the sense of pleasure increased. I felt reassured, too, protected like a child. I could tell her everything and be sure she'd understand. It's good to see you, I said. This was the standard thespian greeting, but I meant it. It's good to see you, too, Joe. When my cue came a moment later, I didn't walk onto the stage. I made an entrance. Everything clicked into place. I found it impossible to go wrong. You were pretty good tonight, Alice said in her car afterwards. Not as good as you, I said. You're smiling, Alice said as we drove along. I'm happy. My God, I wish I were. What's the matter, love? Oh, never mind, she said. It's too damn sordid and boring to explain. You need a drink. Well, do you mind if we didn't? She laughed. Don't look so woe-begone, honey. You want to go home? Well, not particularly. I'd like to go to Sparrow Hill, she said. Well, it's cold up there. That's what I want, she said violently. Somewhere cold and clean. No people, no dirty people. I turned the Fiat into Sparrow Hill Road. Narrow, twisting, steep, with the fields and weeds on either side stretching out into the black and endless distance. The fields and woods clinging to the hillside gave way to the plateau of Worley Moors. A little ahead I saw the old brickworks, and hard by them Sparrow Hill rising abruptly from the surrounding flatness. We're too visible here, said Alice. Turn to the left behind the hill. Sparrow Hill is set back some two hundred yards from the road. The side facing the road is bare except for short, sheep-nibbled grass, but the far side is covered with bushes and bracken, 
and there's a big grove of beeches at the foot of the hill. I stopped in the shelter of the trees. My heart was beating hard, and when I gave Alice a cigarette, my hand was trembling. We're too visible here. I knew exactly what the words implied, and somehow I didn't want them to imply anything. I wanted to postpone what was going to happen within the next few minutes. I was on the verge of a new territory, and it frightened me. Alice was much more than a pair of willing thighs, and she would ask for much more than quick comfort. I didn't at the time put it to myself as clearly as this, but I definitely remember thinking that I felt exactly as I did when I had my first woman, a plump waff whose name I've forgotten at the age of 18. So I talked to her. I talked without stopping, and I don't remember what I talked about. It was as if I were put in a filibuster. A kind of bill was to be passed which would alter my whole life, and I wasn't sure that I wanted my whole life to be altered. Then I stopped talking, or rather my voice trailed off into silence independently of me. I looked at her. She was smiling with a tight, almost painful expression. Her hands were clasped over her knees, a skirt drawn back above them. I leaned over toward her. I've been thinking about you all week. I've been dreaming about you, do you know that? She put out her hand and touched the nape of my neck. I kissed her. Her lips tasted of tobacco and toothpaste. They were held moistly and laxly against mine in a way that was entirely new to me, utterly different from her dry and light stage kisses. Her breast felt astoundingly heavy and full against me. She seemed to be much younger, much more feminine and soft than I'd ever imagined her to be. I'm all twisted, she said. This is a terribly moral kind of car. Well, go outside, I said hoarsely. She kissed my hands. They're beautiful, she said. Big and red and brutal. Would you keep me warm? I remember those words especially. They were empty and tawdry. They didn't match what took place in the beech grove soon afterwards. But they were Alice's own words, and I preserved them like saints' relics. And yet there was no great physical pleasure for either of us that night. It was too cold. I was too nervous, and there was too much messing about with buttons and zips and straps. It was best when we finished. It was like having a cup of really good coffee and a Havana after an indifferently cooked but urgently needed meal. It was a clear, starlit night. Through a gap in the trees I could see the distant hills. I kissed Alice on the little wing of hair just above the temple. The hair at that point always seems to me to smell differently from the hair on the rest of the head. It's vulnerable and soft and somehow babyish. She pressed herself more closely against me. You're all warm, she said. My dear overcoat, I'd like to sleep with you, Joe. Truly sleep, I mean, in a big bed with a feather mattress and brass rails and a china chamber pot underneath it. I wouldn't let you sleep, I said, not then understanding. She laughed. We will sleep together, pet, I promise you. It's never been like this before, I said. Nor me. Did you know this was going to happen? She didn't answer. After a moment she said, Please don't fall in love with me, Joe. We will be friends, won't we? Loving friends. Loving friends, I said. When I was starting the car going back, she didn't speak at all, but she was smiling to herself all the way. Perhaps it was only a trick of the light, but her hair seemed as if it were glowing from within. I drove fast along the narrow switchback of Sparrow Hill Road, taking the corners as if on rails, I couldn't go wrong. The car felt as if it had two litres underneath its bonnet instead of just over a half. I was the devil of a fellow. I was the lover of a married woman. I was taking out the daughter of one of the richest men in Worley. There wasn't a damn thing I could do. Say what you like of me when I was younger, but I certainly wasn't blasé. I spent Christmas at my Aunt Emily's. In Dufton, the snow seemed to turn black almost before it hit the ground. Christmas there always seemed a bit ashamed of itself, 
as if it knew that it was a wicked waste of good money. Dufton and Gaiety just weren't on speaking terms, and the house at Oak Crescent was small and dark and smelly and cluttered up. It wasn't that I didn't care for Aunt Emily and her family, but I was too much of t top now, and half hating myself for it, I found myself seeing them as foreigners. They were kind and good and generous, but they weren't my sort of person any longer. I saw Charles on Boxing Day at our local. How was your sex life that way? he asked. Satisfactory. I see Alice every week. Weather's a bit cold for it, he said. She borrows a friend's flat in Lettersford. You be careful, chum. No, oh, she's not possessive. It's not that sort of an affair. What sort exactly was it, though? I remembered once, through half-closed eyes, watching her take up my shirt from beside the bed and kiss it. When she saw me looking at her, she blushed and turned away. I felt myself blushing, too. It's perfect, I said firmly. She's wonderful in bed, and she wants nothing else from me. She will. No, not Alice. Keep right on believing that, and it won't be long before I see your name in Sunday papers. Oh, eh, I said. It's a simple, straightforward transaction. Just for the sake of our health, that's all. Besides, it helps keep myself pure for Susan. The Lampton charm not working. I've been out with her about half a dozen times now. Theatre in the cinema and a five bob hop. It's most genteel. Cost me a hell of a lot of money. Flowers, chocolates and all the rest of it and I get nothing in return. Perhaps you're trying too hard. Why not leave her alone for two months or so? Don't quarrel with her, don't attempt to discover how you stand. Simply stop seeing her. If she's at all interested in you, she'll be a bit uffed. Or she'll wonder what's wrong with her. Remember, she's got into the habit of seeing you, poor bitch. But don't, he wagged his finger at me, say a word to anyone else. If you do run across her, behave as if nothing had happened. His face looked very red above his stiff white collar. There was a chess player's intentness in his pale blue eyes. It should be very interesting. Report back with full detail, Sergeant, if you survive. She mayn't give a curse whether I see her or not, I said. She probably won't even notice that I've gone. In that case, you'll have lost nothing, and you'll have saved your pride. Oh, I'd be scared of losing her, I said. I'm in love with her, he snorted. In love with her? Drivel, in lust with her? And Daddy's bank balance? I know you, you scoundrel. Do what Uncle Charles advises, and all will be gas and gators. Uh, I might try it, I said. I was sitting in the bar parlour of the Western Hotel just opposite the town hall. I'd taken Charles' advice and hadn't tried to see Susan since Christmas. I hadn't much hope of his plan working. In fact, I'd almost decided to write her off. But that evening, probably as a result of four pints inside me, I started to daydream. I did the job thoroughly, too. There was a letter from Susan inviting me to a party and asking plaintively if she'd done anything to offend me. Or, better still... The doorbell would ring one wild, wet evening, and she'd be standing there, her face rosy with the wind. Perhaps she'd come ostensibly to see the Thompsons on thespian business, or perhaps she might simply say, I had to come, Joe. You think I'm shameless, but... And I'd kiss her, and there'd be no need to speak. We'd stand there listening to the rain, walling us into happiness together, and then we'd go out to Sparrow Hill. I love walking in the rain with you, she'd say, and we'd walk on and on, the good clean air fresh in our lungs, walking on forever, the fairy story come true. But it wasn't quite like that. I was sitting in the bar parlour with Reggie after dinner, feeling agreeably full of food and beer, but not so full that there wasn't room for a few more pints. I'd just finished telling Reggie a dirty story, the sort that one can only tell at stag parties. That's the muckiest I've ever heard, he said admiringly. Where the devil do you get them from, Joe? That reminds me. Ran across Susan the other day. Susan Brown? 
I kept my voice flat deliberately. We had quite a cosy little chat. I bought her a coffee at Riley's. After all, if you won't look after the girl, someone's got to. We talked about you most of the time. You couldn't choose a better subject. I don't think so, old man. I kept trying to point out my own merits in a discreet sort of way, but it was all Joe Lampton. Isn't Joe handsome? Isn't Joe clever? Wasn't Joe wonderful in the play? I got sick of it. You're joking. Wish I were. You haven't seen her for a bit, have you? I drained off my pipe. Another? I tried to keep the triumphant smile off my face as I ordered another round. You're quiet, darling, Alice said. I was admiring your figure, I said. My God, you are beautiful. I'd like a picture of you like this. I'd keep it locked away and look at it whenever I felt depressed. Looking back, I can see exactly how it happened. It need never have happened. Those were the key words, spoken idly at Elspeth's flat one Friday evening. If out of any of the countless millions at my disposal I'd used any other words, then my whole life and hers would have taken different courses. But her next words, spoken as idly as mine, started the avalanche. She laughed. There is a picture of me in the nude, she said. She named her home county's town. It's still at the municipal gallery as far as I know. I was an artist model once. It was as if the soft hand gently caressing me had turned hard and big and hit me. I felt sick and betrayed and dirted. I moved away from her in the bed. You never told me. Why don't you tell me? I'd almost forgotten about it. It wasn't very important anyway. I badly needed money and I met this artist at a party and he wanted a model. I modeled for a photographer too. That was all. I didn't do it again. Didn't you? I asked hoarsely. Are you sure? I don't tell lies, she said quietly. You know that. Her eyes were cold. Then she smiled and stretched out her hand. Darling, what a bother about nothing at all. I'd never have told you if I'd known you'd carry on like that. I didn't sleep with either of them, if that's what you're thinking. So you can set your mind at rest. Oh, God, I said miserably. What are you do it for? You didn't have to. There's millions of women have been as poor as you were, and they'd rather have died than expose themselves like that for a few lousy shillings. Damn you to hell. I'd like to beat you black and blue. Damn you, she shouted. What's it to do with you? It was years before I met you. Was I supposed to starve because one day I might meet a narrow-minded proof from Dufton who wouldn't like the idea of me showing the body God gave me? She got out of bed and began to dress hastily. Since your beastly little provincial mind doesn't like nudity, I'd better cover myself up, hadn't I? I started to dress too. If only either of us had laughed, it would have been different. The sight of us both reversing our usual procedure and hurrying to put our clothes on, modestly averting each other's eyes, was actually very funny. But I was too angry and too sick. The idea of being naked for one moment longer turned my stomach. She came over to my side of the bed to fasten up her stockings. That's what you like, isn't it? She said viciously. Leg show and lingerie. She spat out the last word. I took hold of her by her shoulders. You stupid bitch. It isn't that at all. Can't you see that it's the idea of other people looking at your nakedness that I hate? It's not decent, don't you see? Let me go. She said icily. I dropped my hands. My God, I said. I understand now what makes men kill women like you. You're very brave, she said. Highly moral, too. It isn't decent of me to pose for an artist who sees me simply as an arrangement of colour and light, but it's perfectly okay for you to kiss me all over and to lie for an hour just looking at me. I suppose it gave you a thrill, a dirty little thrill, I suppose I'm your own private, dirty postcard. You can't conceive that a man could look at a naked woman without wanting to make love to her, can you? It's not that at all, I said wearily. I went across to the cupboard and poured myself a gin. I took it in one gulp and poured out another. 
Elspeth isn't rich, you know, Alice said waspishly. Her face was white and ugly and old. You needn't take all her gin. I took a pound note from my wallet and tossed it to her. Give that to her. Tell her I broke the bottle. She let it fall to the floor. I was tempted to pick it up. I knew very well that she'd buy Elspeth some more gin. But there are times when a man's dignity is worth more than a pound. I filled my glass again and lit a cigarette. I couldn't trust myself to speak. To think that I let you even touch me, she said quietly. Look at you now. The typical attitude. Glass in hand. Big red face glowering with outraged respectability. I thought you were different, but you're not. You're typical. The decent chap who likes a little bit of fun, but who knows where to draw the line. I'm your little bit of fun. I'm the slice of the cut cake that'll never be missed. You smug, hypocritical swine. I found myself crumpling up my freshly lit cigarette. I threw it away and lit another with a shaking hand. She kept on talking, her voice low and controlled. Get this clear. I own my body. I'm not ashamed of it. I'm not ashamed of anything I've ever done. If you'd ever mixed with intelligent people, you'd not be looking at me now as if I'd committed a crime. She laughed. It was an ugly, harsh laugh, which made my hair prickle. I can just see you in Dufton now, looking at the nudes in a magazine, drooling over them, saying you wouldn't mind having a quick bash, but blackguarding the girls, calling them shameless. The words came from her lips like a gobbet of phlegm. Yes, look shocked. You've used the word often enough with your boozy friends, haven't you? I was damn near starvation when I transgressed your peculiar morality. You wouldn't understand that, would you? You make a great to-do about your humble beginnings, but you've never gone hungry. Her eyes narrowed. I wonder. I wonder. Probably someone else went short for our darling Joe, the fair-haired charmer. I took another drink. It had a musty taste. What do you think a POW gets to eat? I asked bitterly. She laughed again. You didn't starve even then. You got extra because you looked so clean and gnawed it. You told me so. Oh, yes, you always fall on your feet. Why didn't you escape like Jack Wales? That was more than I could stand. Don't mention that swine's name to me, I said furiously. It was all right for him to escape. He had a rich daddy to look after him and to buy him an education. He could afford to waste his time. I couldn't. Those three years were the only chance I'd get to be qualified. Let those rich bastards who have all the fun be heroes. Let them pay for their privileges. If you want it straight from the show, then I'll tell you. I was bloody well pleased when I was captured. I wasn't going to be killed trying to escape, and I wasn't going to be killed flying again. I didn't like being a prisoner, but it was a damn sight better than being dead. Come to that, what did you do in the Great War? All right, she said in a tired voice. You can stop defending yourself. I needn't have brought that up. It's useless trying to explain that what I did isn't important and that there's nothing wrong with it. We're different kinds of people and there's nothing more to be said. Isn't there? It doesn't seem any use trying to explain to you either. I'm not a hypocrite and I'm not a moralist. I don't care if you did sleep with the artist. It's just the thing itself that hurts me. God, I never thought it till now. Why should I? I feel just as if I've been kicked between the legs. I can't help that. You're making your own misery. The tears began to roll down her cheeks. Oh, damn you, damn you, damn you. You'd better have a drink. I gave her a glassful. She drank it, coughing a little. I wanted to take her in my arms and tell her that it didn't matter and that I was wrong and I was sorry. I couldn't bear to see her tears. She looked thin and bedraggled, not unlike the thin women one sees in pictures of mine disasters, disconsolate and old and ugly against the pithead wheel. But remembering the way she'd repulsed me when I touched her, I didn't attempt it. I'd better make some tea, she said. She turned at the doorway. It's all over, she said. I could scarcely hear the words. 
It's all over, Joe. I went into the lounge and sat in the armchair by the fire, feeling sick and cold. I'd never had a quarrel like that before. When father and mother had differences, they were no more than tiffs. He was too easy going and she recovered from her anger too quickly. I couldn't even remember being shouted at. It was all over. Alice was right. I felt as if I'd lost all my strength. There was no way of being comfortable. My body was a shameful encumbrance. There was no sleep ahead of me. I thought of Susan, but it didn't help. She was on the same side of the fence as Alice. Perhaps, I thought, one was earmarked from birth, and only the scoundrels and geniuses ever rose out of the class into which they were born. Alice came in with the tea. You don't want anything to eat? I couldn't. She poured out the tea. We might as well be sensible. We did agree, didn't we? But there'd be nothing permanent about it. I heard my own voice uttering words which I wasn't aware of having chosen. We'll call it a day. Yes, we'll call it a day. She put a hand on mine. It was dry and hot. I won't be possessed, Joe. I won't be dominated. I won't be owned by anyone. Don't think badly of me. I won't. I'm very grateful to you. I was retreating. I wasn't fighting. But from where was I retreating? And who was I fighting? It's been wonderful, Alice. I'm sorry about all this. Forget it, she said. She lifted the teacup to her mouth, but her hand was shaking so much that she spilt half of it. I looked at the pound note on the floor and suddenly discovered that I didn't give a damn about it. I left the flat before Alice, as I generally did. The flat was on the top floor and the lift was out of order. I remember that the stairs seemed never to end and I remember the deep silence of the place. The building had been decorated in the usual post-war manner and had the air of a big ship. There was a queer, dry smell like hot toast and chlorine. The stairs were broad, and a thick grey carpeting seemed to blot up all sound. It was all very clean and shining. Very nice, too, except it gave me the impression that no human being had ever lived there. I imagined nothing but emptiness behind those white doors with their chromium numbers and neat little name cards. Once, all the rich people in Leddesford had lived in the district around the flats. As cars had become more dependable and the city had become more dirty, the rich people had moved out to towns like Worley. The houses, which hadn't been converted into flats and private hotels, now belonged to doctors and dentists and photographers. There were a lot of trees and the roads were broad. In a way, it reminded me of Worley. But it had ceased to be a place a long time ago. It was a clear evening with a warm wind. Spring was on the way. Not that it made much difference there. The laurels and pines and firs would look exactly the same all the year round, dark and melancholy and alien. I wasn't due home until ten. It was only half past eight. There was a vast, useless stretch of time to fill. I occupied my mind with dreariness like a starving man eating earth. It's all over now the sensible part of me said. You're well rid of the neurotic bitch. You're out of the danger of scandal. You're out of the danger of being possessed. But another side of me kept remembering the big tears rolling down her cheeks, remembered with shocked tenderness how they had washed away her attractiveness. I thought with bitter regret of the time when she had been a stranger to me, and I wouldn't have cared if she walked the streets naked in broad daylight. She'd done that as if I hadn't existed. I bit my lip sharply, drawing blood. My head was throbbing and my mouth tasted of vomit and my throat was dry. I put my hand against the wall. It was as if I was being attacked by an invisible enemy. I crossed the road and kept on walking. Looking back, I see myself as being near the verge of insanity. I couldn't feel like that now. There is, as it were, 
a transparent barrier between myself and strong emotion. I feel what is correct for me to feel. I go through the necessary motions, but I cannot delude myself that I care. I wouldn't say that I was dead, simply that I had begun to die. I have realized, you might say, that I have, at the most, only another sixty years to live. I'm not actively unhappy, and I'm not afraid of death, but I'm not alive in the way that I was that evening I quarreled with Alice. I look back at that raw young man with a feeling of genuine regret. I wouldn't, even if I could, change places with him. But he was, indisputably, a better person than the smooth character I am now, after ten years of getting almost everything that I ever wanted. I know the name he'd give me. The Successful Zombie. I looked at the invitation as I drank my final cup of tea at breakfast. It was a fine morning. The sun had melted all but the last traces of snow in the valley, and one could almost smell the green things growing. For the first time in a week, I didn't think of Alice. Sally Carstairs has asked me to her birthday party, I said to Mrs. Thompson. She's a thoroughly nice girl. Weren't you in a play with her? Uh, she out with the props. Don't know her very well, though. What should I give her? I tried to sound matter-of-fact, but I was excited and delighted. The Carstairs had plenty of money. They ran a chain of cafes and lived in a big house in Gildon, right on top of Worley Moors. You leave it to me. I know Sally's mother very well. How much should I spend? Leave that to me, too. I won't break you, I promise. It's in your hands, I said. I was leaving more and more in her hands, I thought, those long, thin-fingered hands, so much like Alice's. I shied away from the name like a horse from a corpse. I looked at my watch. Ah, time to get my nose to the grindstone. I said goodbye to Mrs. Thompson. When I passed her chair, I wanted to kiss her. Not passionately, I may add, but as I would have kissed my mother on my way to work. Walking down Eagle Road, I wondered dimly if I might achieve something with Sally. She was small and slim and bright as a budgerigar, and was training at the Lettersford Art School. My mind shied away again, for this time it was more of an automatic sidestepping from what might disturb me than a violent and painful revulsion. As I walked down the hill, I experienced the conqueror's sensation again. Worley was below in the valley waiting to be possessed. I'd just come from a beautiful room as near to top as made no difference. I was going to a rich house to meet rich people, and who could say what would become of it? There were about twenty people at the party when I arrived, most of whom I hadn't met before. The girls were dressed to kill. I remember that Sally was wearing a blue dress which exposed a great deal of her very pleasant bosom, and neither Anne Barbie looked bedworthy in white and rose and chiffon. The room we stood in was the largest I'd ever seen in a private house, and it had the first parquet floor I'd seen outside a library or museum. The furniture was of the kind that was to become fashionable ten years later, and each wall was in a different shade of green. But as soon as I saw Susan, I stopped noticing my surroundings. She was wearing a black taffeta skirt and a white brodery anglaise blouse. She made all the other girls look worn and shop-soiled. If anyone ever needed a justification of the capitalist system, I thought, here it was. A human being perfect of its kind, a phoenix among the barnyard folk. Hello, I said. You look good enough to eat. My eyes were holding hers. Mine were the first to drop. I didn't know you were coming here. She pouted. Do you mean you wouldn't have come if you'd known I'd come? Oh, on the contrary. I couldn't hope to enjoy myself without you. You're a festivity in yourself. You're making fun of me, she said in a low voice. Ah, oh, I'm quite serious. Not that I have any right to be. She didn't speak for a moment. But stood looking at me intently. 
I noticed for the first time that her eyes were flecked with gold, bright and alive and dancing. Looking into them and smelling her scent, I felt my head swimming. I don't see why you haven't any right to be serious, she said. It's not... not fair if you're joking. I've never loved her more than I did then. I forgot the Jaguar and the Bentley and the Ford V8. She loved, and she wanted to be loved. She was transparent with affection. I could no more deny that correct response in my heart than refuse a child a piece of bread. In the back of my mind, a calculator machine rang up success and began to compose a triumphant letter to Charles. But that part of me that mattered, the instinctive, honest part of me, went out to meet her with open hands. After supper, the floor was cleared for dancing. Susan was a good dancer, precise and light and free, always, as it were, poised above the ground, gay with weightlessness. In the intervals we sat on the sofa and held hands. Her hands were white and a little plump, and the nails were rosy and gleaming. I thought of Alice's, already on the verge of boniness, the index finger yellow with tobacco and the nails flecked with white. Whenever I looked at Susan, she gave me a frank, full-hearted smile. No reservations, no pretense. I could sense the joyfulness kicking inside her like a child. Halfway through the evening, they put on a tango. I can't do this one, I said to her. Neither can I. It's uh, terribly warm in here. I was thinking that too. It was cool outside. And as we walked over to the summer house, we both retained the lightness of dancing in our feet. It was as if the lawn were a sprung floor. There was a full moon, softening the inflamed harshness of the red brick front. When I took her in my arms, she was trembling violently. I kissed her on the forehead. That's a pure kiss for you, I said. I kissed her again on the lips. Don't be frightened, dearest. I'm never frightened of you. I wanted to give her something, as one would give a child a packet of sweets when it's pleased to see you. I wanted badly to give her something worth as much as what I knew she was at that moment giving me. Tomorrow? I asked. I'll phone at ten. No. Why? You were very wicked to Susan before. You said you'd phone and you never did. Say when and where. Six, at the Lettersford Grand. Oh, darling. I kissed her cheeks and her chin and her nose and the smooth nape of her neck. She was still trembling. I wish we could stay here for always, she said. So do I, dearest. <laughs>